Thank you, Nick, for agreeing to do this interview. It's fantastic to be able to talk to people who are involved in cars uh, in my life. And, you know, the Jaguar XJ220, I mean, what a car. It's just such an amazing car. So the first question really is, how did you get involved in the XJ220 project? Yeah, in a way, I was I was lucky. I was I was a new designer at Jaguar. Um, I'd been there about a year after, after college. Um, in those days, the design team, the styling studio, was was a very small team. It wasn't more than eight or ten people, really. Um, and there were a couple of projects on. Um, one was a new sports car, which um, XJ41, which was supposed to be based on XJ40 uh, on a shorter wheelbase uh, and so on. That that car had been, there was never enough money to put it into production. So it had been on the go for a few years um, in terms of the, the styling was fixed, but the interior hadn't really been developed. And uh, so I was working on that a little bit with uh, another designer. Um, and then in the summer of 1985, um, my boss, who was, Keith Helfert um, mentioned that there was uh, a kind of secret project um, which wasn't part of the official product plan, which was uh, a Group B uh, car, which was you know, a road going uh, supercar. Um, the kind of brief for it was it, it was um, it was fairly clear what it was. It was um, at that time, Group B was was particularly dominating or, or influencing rallying um, things like the you know the Ford RS two hundred, um, the Lancia, the the, the Peugeot um, two hundred five rally cars. Those were done under Group B rules, and the Group B for road going cars was kind of less defined. The Porsche nine five nine had had come out. Uh, the F40, we didn't know about the F40, and there had been the Ferrari 288 GTO um, uh, launched around that time. And so, yeah, it seemed an obvious thing to do, to do a, you know, a flagship car. The company had been recently privatised the year before from away from British Leyland. So, again, it was an optimistic time and something to do. Um, so I started to get involved um, more with the exterior to start with, really. And it was myself and Keith and another young designer from the Royal College of Art, a guy called Mark Lloyd. Mark was a um, he was a, a qualified aerodynamicist, so he kind of quickly took took the lead on the the exterior um, for that. Uh, but the good thing was there wasn't really a set time scale. Um, you know, it didn't have to be done in a year or or two years. It was a fairly loose time scale, and it was a very small um, group of mainly very senior engineers who were involved in it. So for myself and Mark, we were by far the, the most junior staff on this uh, team. Um, so when it came to, it was a very sort of um, loosely run project, uh, very few informal meetings. It tended to be after hours and particularly on Saturdays uh, and, and so on. Um, so to go to those kind of meetings, we were by far the most junior members uh, there. Uh, but after a few months, it was clear that there was uh, nobody was uh, sort of designated to do the interior. And I suppose I saw an opportunity there that, to take ownership of that. And I was working on interiors and it, it was a nice project uh, with, with a lot of freedom, really. So it was good to get involved. So I started doing sketches and um, tape drawings. We built an interior buck um, and so on um to start trying out um ideas so yeah it's a nice opportunity really to do that mm. it's yeah. yeah you learn very fast when you have a lot of senior people around you uh <laughs> you learn yeah. a lot of stuff very quickly and yeah. the work i was doing on other interiors i was doing i mean i was supporting other designers so it wasn't a clean sheet interior there was lots of work on things like xjs facelifts that the interior for xjs had to be quite often updated just to meet us regulations uh, airbags things like that all of which involved small bits of design work but you know they have to be done um and xj40 was um being finished off there's lots of bits to finish off on the interior for that and then other derivatives long wheelbase and um, uh, and so on so there were other interior projects going on so i hadn't done many interior projects when I started on on this one, 
Mm. So obviously after this, you went on to work for Honda and that's all passenger cars and, and regular cars. But so what's the difference between doing an, an interior for a supercar versus a, like a regular passenger car? I think actually it's a lot easier. Um, later on, I went to, I, I worked first for Peugeot in France and also for, yeah, then 10 years with Honda. With Honda, we did a lot of interiors and, you know, things like Honda Civics um, and CRV, uh, Accords and so on. Yeah, with those kind of cars, there are many, many constraints um, to do with cost, um, particularly, um, and to do with packaging. Um, but in some ways, I must admit, I, I found doing, you know, say a Honda Civic interior afterwards actually a lot more satisfying in many ways in that it was, uh, um, you know, the constraints and the challenges put on you as a designer are what sort of push you to do something. Um, whereas with the supercar, there are relatively few constraints in terms of um, of cost, um, particularly um, in terms of tooling. You know, it's going to be very low volume. So there are, you know, it, it, stuff can be kind of handmade or done in very low volume which you couldn't possibly consider for a for a, a high volume uh, production e even a even a volume production jaguar so yeah there's lots of freedoms that that, that, that come with it um, actually yeah so the original xj220 had butterfly doors and was that a particular challenge for the work that you did to try and make those fit in, or is it just, it's just a door? Yeah, the doors, they could have been, they could have been conventional doors. Um, so from the exterior point of view, um, uh, it it was fairly open for the, for the concept uh, car. I guess because it was a concept, they were, we did butterfly doors just for the drama, the theater of it. Um, uh, as a concept um and uh, in fact the we didn't really have a, a body engineer support so when it came to butterfly doors I, I did all the engineering for that basically um so it, it was quite tricky to work out the just the path of the door so that it cleared door seals and, uh, and so on um, and the fact that it was taking part of the dashboard up with it we had to make sure that cleared the a pillar um correctly um, so it goes up and actually slightly outwards. And um, yeah, we we just kind of engineered it on the hoof, really. Um, we used hinges from a Dame limousine because they were just the biggest, strongest hinges that were to hand. Um, but the, in fact, they were never fully engineered in terms of, um, you know, gas struts and, and things like that. And, and the, the car subsequently had... had um, um, other systems built into it to make it um, uh, a little bit more secure and safe for, for opening the doors and propping them up um, as an exhibition uh, piece, really. Um, so, yeah, there were quite a lot of um, challenges um, with that. Um, and for the production car, those those were dropped simply because they, they add a lot more weight and complication into uh, what was already a, a complicated and heavy car. Um, and it went with conventional doors. So that's, that's a good question. So this is the first time you've designed butterfly doors. So how do you how do you start doing that? Do you look at existing cars? Just I mean, and how do you go and do that? Because they're all supercars, right? Or or is there some sort of standardized book that says if you do a butterfly door, this is sort of how you do it? How, how do you start on, on that doing that? Um, I think we just did some full size drawings uh, on a, on a on a full size drawing board just worked out you know where some hit the, where the hinge point needs to be and uh how far it needs to open um and we kind of mocked bits and pieces up in in, in cardboard and bits of foam core just to to prove it out a little bit and then took the drawings along to the uh, uh to the workshop where the the body was being made and and just uh tried bits out in metal there so it was all a bit hand to mouth really it wasn't wasn't a great piece of um, um, process engineering, I would say. Um, yeah, but it was maybe not the conventional way. But in the end of the day, this was a concept car, and and when it launched, it was a concept car that was really, my understanding, it wasn't intended for production. Well, um, it was designed as a Group B uh, car, so the 
Group B regulations would have demanded 200 units. Um, so it was engineered that it, it, it could be put into low volume production. Um, it was always clear that um, Jaguar itself would be unlikely to produce it. Um, and with Tom Walkinshaw racing as the, the racing partner for the Le Mans cars, it kind of seemed obvious for them to maybe be involved with that. Uh, they were starting to be involved on the on the road cars as a as a um, uh, as a product uh, uh, a, uh, a factory supported um, tuner, a little bit like Mercedes and AMG or BMW M Sport. So Jaguar Sport as a as a company was formed uh, between TWR and Jaguar. So they were the obvious candidates that you know there could be a um, a facility there that, that could build 200 um, off. Um, so it was particularly on the engineering side in terms of the, the four wheel drive system and the, um, you know, suspension um, and the, the bodies. It, it was planned that, it, you know, there could be 200 built. So it wasn't a purely a one off um, um, concept. There have been consideration to that. OK, however, when um, when the project was then given to Jaguar Sport in, in 1990 and they went through the car, um, yeah, they really had to, it had to start all over again. And there were a lot of uh, parts of it which, which um, you know, hadn't been considered um, a, a, as a concept. And, you know, in terms of um, road regulations, um, things like wing mirror positions, and vision angles were, it was right on the limit. There, there are regulations for the... The downwards vision from your eye to the base of the screen over the bonnet of sort of four degrees downwards and sort of one degree um, over the instrument panel and so on, uh, and it was right on the limit of those in the concept uh, car, um, and that, that was still a challenge with the the production car. Yeah. Um, you couldn't just simply put a few spacers underneath the uh, the, pass the the driver's seat to make it work. <laughs> well, it's pretty tight. I mean, you do you you know when it's homologated, you have to make sure that the the seat is um, optimized so that it does meet all the regulations and uh, uh, and so on. Um, the biggest problem with the, the concept car from a um, for as a production car was that it was just, it was just too heavy. There wasn't a tire. Uh, around at the time that could take uh, it weighed about 1850 kilograms there wasn't a tire that could take that weight and do 200 miles an hour um the pirelli tires which were the best then sort of things like porsche 959 used those it was those were much lighter cars so it had to lose 450 kilograms otherwise it, it you know there were no tires that, that could take that weight and that speed and that's what drove the the, the need to um ditch the v12 engine which is incredibly heavy engine and four-wheel drive system and go for something which was um which was feasible which could actually you know achieve over 200 miles an hour um, uh, uh, um and so on and that's that's where the other engine came in so um yeah the the concept car as it as it stood yeah that that couldn't have become a production car um it was just too big too heavy um, yeah. for that so, so it's released as a concept. Everyone loves it at the motor show, and Jaguar decides, okay, we're going to produce this. So you're now taking a concept interior design, and you're now turning it into a production car. So, what were the challenges around that? And also, this is about the time when Ford purchases Jaguar. So, did you end up using Ford? parts in the in the interior or how much um how much flexibility did you have to be able to use bespoke parts versus jaguar or ford parts yeah uh, i'll answer the second part first um there weren't really any constraints put on us it was right if you're correct that um ford bought jaguar at the end of 1989 which was just about when the project for production was was being started by jaguar sport um, because it was so specialised, um, there weren't really any constraints put on the other um, engineers in terms of sourcing parts. There weren't many parts that they they could have used from from Ford um, it, it, in terms of uh, you, you know suspension or braking or, or anything. 
Um, for the interior, yeah, I did choose Ford parts. I wasn't under any pressure to. Um, it was simply that there was kind of the feeling, well, if Ferrari use Fiat parts and it, it seems okay, um, it's part of that kind of link to the parent company, then um, maybe for us to use Ford parts um, wouldn't be a bad idea. And Jaguar itself didn't have many components. You know, it, ha it had two models, XJ, XJS and XJ40. Um, yeah, there weren't actually many parts to choose from and they weren't particularly suitable. So we'd have to have gone outside to use other proprietary parts. There wasn't the, the money uh, or the possibility to use uh, bespoke parts for a lot of things like switches and interior handles and um, steering columns um, uh, and, and so on. Uh, so, you know, they would have to be off the shelf from, from something. And um you know if it had come from i don't know a renault or something at that time i guess it, it, it might seem a bit odd people were always going to spot where these come from so maybe if it come came from ford that was uh less of an evil than if it came from um a, a rover car or something like that at, at the time so the vents were from a ford fiesta and the interior handles uh were from escorts um and um, trying to remember some, yeah, some of the switches, I think, were also Ford. So it's those kind of plastic interior parts, which are, are very expensive to tool up, um, way beyond the budget. So, um, yeah, we had to source those from something. So those were, were Ford parts. Um, so that was the thinking behind that. Um, after the concept was, was shown, I, I, I'd left Jaguar, and, and so did um, um, Mark Lloyd, the other young design he went to Citroen I went to Peugeot um, and what happened then was when the Jaguar Sport team of, of engineers started on the project um, you know they didn't have anyone to do the interior and uh, I, I just had a phone call um, from Tom Walkinshaw's secretary one afternoon uh, towards the end of 89 saying well would you like to come back to the UK and and do this project and it was kind of a difficult decision because I hadn't been in France very long and I was enjoying my new job. Um, so I was quite torn between the, the two, the two uh, possibilities, really. But I guess there's half of me that sort of wanted to finish the job off and thinking, well, I don't want to trust it to someone else um, to do that. Um, you know, and it is a nice project to have in your, uh, in your portfolio as well. The big problem when I then arrived back was that the rest of the team had started on this project about three months before. And so lots of the decisions about the interior and the way the car was being shortened and redesigned um, in terms of the interior chassis, um, uh, there hadn't really been any consideration about how the interior would fit into that. And the other constraint was that the, the photos had all been published and um, the deposits had been taken, 50,000 pounds from customer, 350 customers. So the car and the interior had to look like in those photos as far as possible. And so after about three days, um, you know, I, I had to go to uh, the project boss, Mike Morton, and say, there's no way that the interior that I designed could fit into this new interior package. There's, you know, there's the, um, you know, there's, there's whole chunks of, uh, of chassis that are, that are in the way. And um, so it wasn't a good start, really. Um, so it, it was quite a, a challenge to get that interior theme into the new um, into the new interior uh, chassis because, because uh, it had been completely re-engineered with you know conventional doors, um, a shorter wheelbase, um, uh, and so on, uh, and things like a, a you know air conditioning unit had to go be built in there, um, uh, and so on. So there were yeah there were lots of um, difficulties with that. Um, which took time to uh, to resolve. When the car, <laughs> when the car was shortened, there was um, ten inches taken out of the, the wheelbase, which is a massive amount, and and uh, two inches out of the the rear overhang. Um, sorry, eight inches out of the the wheelbase and two inches out of the rear overhang. But everything forward of the the A pillar wasn't changed, um, and um, Keith Helfer is the exterior designer. Um, and myself, we, we wanted to both change the uh, the front of the car and move the front axle forward because it looked a little unbalanced then. Um, but by that stage, uh, it was too late, and, and they were saying, you know, the, the program's got 
time, you know, tight deadlines every week is a very tight time scale on this. And they've already started on the um, the designing of the front end for crash um, crash performance and so on. And it was way too late even then to start redesigning the front end. Um, so, yeah, that's a bit of a regret that the, you, know, you could have done with the, the front overhang shortening, the front axle moving forward it would have made a better interior package too. But, um, yeah. It was a very tight time scale by this point. It was 18 months to, to design it for production and, and launch it by September 91 at, at Tokyo Motor Show. And then first cars would go on sale a few months after that. So it, it, there was really tight time scales every, every week, whereas the concept had a very leisurely time scale over several years. Um, uh, and the, the production car was very different. It was very, um, uh, you know, it was, it was very, tight in terms of um you know development and testing um particularly so prototypes had to be built very quickly so a lot of design decisions had to be taken really in the, for those first few weeks and months um uh, pretty fast uh so yeah that, that was that hmm. yeah very stressful time i would think yeah i have to say ford um it, again, quite lucky in, in that Ford really didn't get involved very much. Um, they just bought Jaguar. They had big problems with Jaguar what, what, with what they'd bought in terms of the, the company and the factories and the quality and the fact that there were no new models in the pipeline. So I think Ford senior managers were quite happy that this supercar was kind of being developed. It was it was bubbling away in the background. It was it was um, um, you know still newsworthy, and it was the only thing that was going to be new for at least. Um, two years so they were kind of quite happy for it to uh, to go on in the background and because it was a, a limited production um, very high performance car uh, you know they they were happy to leave it to uh, TWR uh, and the engineers there to to develop it as much as possible rather than get their own people I I involved um, a couple of yeah. years later I think it could have been quite different you know they would have put people in to, to run it and manage it but there were quite a number of Ford people that were there People like Mike Morton, who had come from Ford, he developed the RS two hundred. So, again, it was lucky that that um, you know he was he was a very trusted person by Ford, and, and they left him just to get on with it. Um, it was good. I think I think once projects start, I think it's it it, it it's it's harder to stop them. Plus, the the XJ two twenty was also budgeted that it was going to make a profit. So. It's, it's a natural thing. Plus, it's a halo car, so it's a natural thing. Just to, okay, we're just going to keep it going. That's it. It was self-financing because the customers put down fifty thousand pound deposits, so there was seventeen and a half million pounds sitting there in the bank that was paying the wages and paying for the tooling and the development. Um, and uh, for most of the development time, that you know that that was that was going to be enough. And um, Tom Wapishaw seemed quite happy. He realised there was a there was a profit margin that towards the end of that two year period, that uh, that budget was being eaten up pretty fast, as is often the way. Um, you know, things didn't necessarily go to plan. Things were delayed. Stuff had to be redesigned. Um, you know, and that, there wasn't any new money coming in. Uh, things started to get a little bit tight towards the end, and and they needed to get cars into production and sold to bring money in. So again, Ford were you know weren't having to put their own money into that. It was a self-financing project. Again, very unusual from from mm. that point of view. So, how yeah. important was TWR to Jaguar in the nineteen eighties? They, they were vitally important in terms of the racing side. All the the Le Mans uh, cars from nineteen eighty. Well, originally that the, the uh, uh, the British touring cars with the XJSs, um, and then later the the XJR Le Mans series. Um, yeah, that that was totally uh, TWR. There was there was very little direct involvement from from Jaguar at, at Browns Lane, um, you know, and it was bringing great headlines and and um, uh, and race successes and so on throughout the eighties, um, which as a newly privatized company, um, you know, made it an exciting company which which was uh you know we seemed to be able to start to compete with with porsche and ferrari for, for the first time um you know it made it a much sexier company um and and a company which would was um 
would be a, a good bet to, to take over either by GM or Ford, as it as it turned out, those were the two that were most interested in it. Mm. The brutal truth was Jaguar probably couldn't have continued as an independent um, manufacturer for much longer than the than the, the late eighties or into the early nineties. With the recession in the early nineties, with, without Ford behind it at that point, it, it would have been very very difficult. So there were kind of some glory years in the late eighties, and, and TWR were definitely a key part of that in terms of bring, bringing race success, winning at, at Le Mans in, in, in 1988 particularly was, was a really high moment. And that, that Le Mans moment was just before the XA220 supercar was was launched, matter of weeks before that was in the in the June and, and uh, you know, it was launched in, in that autumn. So there's still a lot of hype about Jaguar and successes uh, and, and so on. So, that, you know, the timing was, was great for that. Mm. Um, so one part of the uh, interior of the production car, which is a little bit interesting or different, is that you have this wraparound part on the driver's side where you have a set of, I think it's four gauges or there's some additional gauges over there on the, on the driver's side. That's a bit of a unique element. Why did you incorporate that? Was it really just trying to fit things in because it was so, everything was so tight? Um. There were two things really. One was just that the doors were very, very deep. The you know it had these wide shoulders to it, so the doors were incredibly uh, deep in themselves. So part of it was just well, what can we put in there to to fill up the the depth of the door on the driver's side and give it some functional benefit. And the second reason was um, yeah that kind of wraparound thing. It was a reversal of what had what had been the the layout of the instruments in in the D type and and uh, in XJ13. To some extent, uh, there were extra in instruments on on those cars. It was on on the centre of the car, facing towards the driver. So it was just a, a reversal of that to put them into the doors. And um, I sketched this out, and, and uh, Jeff Lawson, the, the design director, he, he kind of looked at the sketches and said, "Yeah, I like that." And, and he reminded me that Vauxhall and a project he had worked on, which was the um, the Vauxhall SBR concept from 1970. Had put the instruments in the doors as well. That was a car I knew nothing about, and, and he showed me some photos of it and said, "Yeah, yeah, they tried it then." And, and so he was kind of keen on the idea as well because it was an idea that, that he'd been involved with earlier on. So partly to uh, to give the wide door some functional benefit and, and a, 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 a unique theme as well, and partly as a, a sort of nod to heritage as well um, with that. Um, but yeah, I mean, they were just auxiliary instruments of of uh, oil temperature and um, um, oil pressure, yeah, um, and a clock, and I forget what the fourth one was an ammeter. I think you know they weren't they weren't vital instruments, and to be honest, it, the car didn't necessarily need them. Um, but it was a nice, you know, it was a nice sort of wraparound theme to to include that no other car had with those. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's got to be theatre in a car like that. I mean, that, that's the sort of car that, that, that you're buying. And so, yeah, to have something different and unique makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and very much. I mean, one of the um, points of that interior was was that it, it was um, both the concept car and the production car. The, the two interiors, they shared a common theme, but actually um, they were two quite different projects, um, uh, really. And... Um, was that it should be a, a luxurious and, and cosseting interior. It wasn't a stripped out race car interior. Um, that that wasn't the um, that wasn't the aim. So the Ferrari sort of F40 was much more of a stripped out car. Most Group B cars, you know, Ford RS 200 or um, you know rally cars were were stripped out sort of racers, and and this was going to be something that was much more uh, luxurious and, and, and cosseted and. Um, um, uh, and so on. Um, there were other concepts from around that time which did influence it. I'd say actually the um, the Buick Wildcat concept it did influence the exterior quite a bit. And the um, um, yeah, there was a Pontiac Firebird concept again that that kind of sloth, softly swooping shape and and a very dark glass canopy and very cab forwards 
um, those kind of cars had come out and they, they did influence the, the exterior form quite a bit. And on the interior, the MG had done the EXE concept mm. with a fantastic mm. interior. It was done by a, a friend of mine. And um, so it was kind of a bit of competition between him and me to, uh, you know, to do another interior, which was um, uh, which was good as that that EXE interior, which, which was a fabulous piece of work uh, really as well. Um, so that yeah. that was the uh, sort of um, impetus behind behind that that interior. Yeah. It almost seems to me like the the XG XJ two twenty was the what the EXE could have been. It was you know MG was uh, or Austin Rover at that time was trying to do that. They just didn't have the funds. Jaguar did have the funds and did it and did it spectacularly. And yeah, it could have been an amazing car. Uh, it, 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 indeed, um, that was it. Um, yeah, was, was the other parts of the interior. The um, I mean, other, in terms of proprietary parts, um, the, the seats were very difficult because they had to be um, uh, they had to be adjustable seats, um, and. Um, uh, you know they needed a steel frame so just finding a seat frame which which um um uh, which you could use in a car like that was was actually quite difficult the, the concept we, we'd use xjs seats but actually that those seat frames weren't ideal at all and were very heavy and uh, uh i found that the, the bmw z1 seat z1 had, had come out uh, that seat had a, a seat frame which, which sat very very low onto the floor and, um, uh, and so we used that seat frame um, unchanged and just put new foams on it. Um, and that, that was the seat for the XJ220 that was done that way. Um, uh, yeah, there would be no other way of, do, of doing it because, you know, to have to meet crash performance um, uh, and so on with safety belts. Uh, yeah, you, you couldn't just have a, a, you know, a Kevlar race seat or, or something like that in, in a car like that. It just wouldn't have. Um, wouldn't have met those regulations. Um, so it's interesting. There, there were two very, two very, very different groups um, with the production car because um, most of the engineers were race engineers. So there was very little understanding of of um, uh, developing a, a production car because even at two hundred, you know, that's very different from a race car project where you produce one or two, you know, possibly four or five. Um, so for those guys, um, you know, dealing with, with tooling up parts, um, you know, and lead times um, and the fact that, um, uh, you know, stuff has to has to meet um, uh, road regulations, you know, was was um, they kind of struggled with that a, a lot part of the time. They, they came from a completely different philosophy um, and m myself and. Uh, couple of other guys who come from Austin Rover um yeah they've come from the production car side and, and, and the two the two groups um it was interesting how, how they they just had completely different starting points on, on something um and the vast majority were, were were race car engineers and all the technicians we had come from racing teams and so on so you know dealing with interior trim and uh, switches and plastic parts um, and getting fit and finish and, and you know high quality in things like soft trim and leather parts and you know getting carpet to fit properly was was a, a com complete anathema to them they, they really couldn't get their head around it a, a, at all um so yeah an interesting uh, um you know learning experience on on, on both sides then it was, uh, it was strange mm. But yes, with with the production car, there was um, um, there was quite a lot that I did actually uh, because I was on the TWR side. I was the only um, you know designer um, who, uh, involved in, in you know, who was on the books who wasn't an engineer um, at, at that time. So when there were lots of other small parts on exterior that needed resolving, whether it's wheels or uh, you know door handle details or grills or stuff like that there were lots of bits that uh, you know actually I ended up sort of doing um quite with that 
there was a little bit of politics involved in the from the TWR side. They didn't want to go back to Jaguar um, to to get um, Keith or another designer involved with that because um, they were a bit afraid of that that it, it was going to hold things up and um, uh, you know and, and stop them hitting a deadline. So if it could be resolved in house or they could use me to do a lot of that stuff. Uh, it was a lot easier um, politically. So I had a slightly tricky hat to wear because on the one hand, um, you know, I was, because I'd, I'd worked in the main Jaguar studio and ultimately the visual parts had to be agreed and signed off with with Jeff Lawson as the, the design director. Jeff, you know, trusted me to to do stuff and I, I'd ask him to come down and, and, and look at things um, as and when and, and, you know, keep him on side. Um, but that didn't make me very popular with the TWR guys. They preferred that I didn't involve people like Jeff Lawson at all or Keith. Uh, but I, I could see you know, it, it was pointless if you didn't involve them and you went too far down the road on something for a few weeks. And then, you know, they came and saw it. If they hadn't been involved, they're likely to say no. Um, and then you're in real trouble. Um, so I, I had, a, I, yeah, I was trying to sort of play two horses there at, at times. which was a little bit tricky. Mm, yes very good yeah it, it, it it's you essentially you were trying to they were trying to make the project run as fast as possible and you were also trying to make the project run as fast as possible given the fact that they didn't realize some of the problems that they could be running into yeah, <laughs> yeah the deep politics kind of going on behind the scenes some some of which i wasn't aware of at, at the time you know yeah. um, i was yeah. kind of too too busy for yeah. that so presumably, once the production car finished, you you didn't do any more work on the XJ220 project, even though they came up with the XJ220S, which may have been a little bit different, may have had some changes to it. Is that, is that right or wrong? That's right. Yeah, but really by um, by the end of 1991, um, my task there was over the all the things that I'd been brought on board to design had, had been designed and it was entering into production there were lots of bits and pieces to be finished off um but i was starting to be bored really and wanted something else to do um there was another project at that point then uh a chap called ian callum came along uh, and he joined twr as the to set up an, a new design studio um uh, which you know went on to be very successful um and uh, but at that time he he didn't have the the budget to to take on another designer and they didn't have a they didn't have another you know a main project uh, they were gunning for another Jaguar project um, but you know it was going to be some months and uh, you know uh, until that was up and running and that project was called XX which, which was a reskin of the Jaguar XJS to do a new sports car um and that um wasn't approved and that became the aston martin db7 um but by that point i i decided to leave and, and uh, i joined um honda so then a year later yeah there were the other you know racing versions of the of the xj220 um but they were done by uh by ian callum yeah okay that makes sense yeah um one of the, any other bits of the XJ220 story that, um, that 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 I've missed mention or you know asking questions about that uh, that, that were interesting. The really interesting part, I suppose, from the the concept car was that, um, as I said, it was never a um, you know it was never part of the product plan. It was never an official project, um, and the there were very few people that knew about it. In, in fact, within the styling studio, everybody knew about it because um, uh, you know there were models of it uh, around. There wasn't a full size car there. There was never a full size clay done um, because there wasn't the budget for it. There was no budget for this at all. It was all just currying favors from suppliers and so on. Um, so there was a yeah, you know, there were scale models that were done, and um, the other reason was that. Every few days in the styling studio, we would have other people coming in from sales and marketing and product planning and so on, who um, you know were not to know about the project. So you know, even within a company, there are, there are 
things that not everybody knows about. So we just throw the covers over the models there and and hide them in a corner. Um, yeah, and it was the same with the interior. We we could hide that away really, uh, and did do for for quite some time. The actual car itself, I mean, it was just one prototype that was built, one body shell that was built that was built off site. Nobody apart from those who were involved in it knew about it, um, and all the um, all the other uh, chassis hardware was being built off site um, uh, and so on. And uh, Jim Randall, the engineering director, who who would, it was his baby, this project. Um, he was a board member, but he, he hadn't actually let the other board members know about it um, until some months before it was it was shown, um, and there hadn't you know there hadn't been a budget for it and so on. The hours we'd spent were our, either our own time or I'll be honest, we just booked hours to other projects um, along the way. There wasn't a lot of time being spent on it. But then at the start of '88, it was decided this is going to be shown later this year that was the aim um so there were some serious hours spent on it then those last few months to get things um, finished um but it was actually only shown to the jaguar board um eight days before the the motor show and it was only at that point that there had to be a decision are they going to show this or not and there was a lot of um you know top end decisions to be said if, if they do show this car what is going to be the official stance of it are we going to say we're going to produce it um what if it isn't well received would it be an embarrassment if it is well received but we can't we haven't got a statement about what we're doing with it what happens then that's an embarrassment so from the sales and marketing point of view they had to quickly um come up with a, with, a, with a plan what was the official line on this car what were they going to say to journalists about it um, uh, and so on and um, so there was a meeting where the car was shown. We just finished the car off site at at, um, um, at another supplier's, and the board members came along and saw it for the first time. And us as team members, we were very nervous about that. We weren't invited to the final meeting. We were there uh, around the car. We'd finished it off. Um, this was about midnight as well board members came and saw it and went off to another room and huddled together for about half an hour and then came out of the room and said we've got a decision and the decision was we are going to show it at the motor show and then that last eight days was a real rush to get everything finished um, in time um, but it was interesting Tom Walkinshaw was also there at that meeting he'd been invited as well um, because obviously they need to decide if, if we say it's going to go ahead um you know we, we need to say we're going to produce it with jaguar sport or you know could he needed to see it to say could he do it or not and so he when he saw the car for the first time that evening he he was absolutely white his face went white he was so shocked because of course he had been developing quietly his own road going supercar with peter stevens xjr15 and he knew nothing about this and he realized um yeah he spent quite a lot of time and investment on this xjr 15 as a road going um uh, le mans car um suddenly his plans for that to, to do a ta-da and show that to jaguar had gone out the window on that evening and and so he it was bizarre seeing his reaction to it on the one hand he was going to get a nice um a nice development project um uh, out of it um, but on the other hand, uh, it wasn't what he was expecting at, at all. So that was an interesting evening. That <laughs> yeah, that makes that makes a lot more sense. So, uh, just a bit of disclosure at the at the moment, I'm uh, putting together a, a video talking about both TVR and TWR, just because what the hell. <laughs> and so I'm going through the history of TWR, and you're right. It's like you've got the XJ220, and then you've got the XJR15 that comes out like two years later. It's like, they look very similar. Why on earth did he do that? And now that makes so much more sense. Yeah, that makes total sense. Yeah, I mean, they were actually being produced at the same time in, in 1992. They were both being produced side by side um, at, at Bloxham. Um, mm. you know, opposite sides of, of, of the yard. XJR15 was a much, um, you know, it was really a road going, barely road going 
um, Group C racer. Um, so it was a much, uh, much more sort of raw uh, supercar than the next year, the next J220. You know, it wasn't luxurious in, in, in any way. And it was bare, barely road legal, just about road legal. Um, and, and made in much, you know, much smaller numbers. You know, the, 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 um, uh, you know, the audience for that car was was a much 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 uh, smaller, um, and yeah. far fewer of them produced, uh, and so on. So it, it was a different, uh, uh, yeah, a different audience. But yeah, the two cars were developed quite separately, two different teams, um, uh, and um, uh, yeah, uh, but but almost in parallel, a, a strange really. Mm. Wonderful. Well. Thank you so much, Nick, for, for doing this. Um, so helpful to, to hear such wonderful stories about the XJ220 and a, a, a pivotal moment for Jaguar and TWR. And, uh, yeah, thank you very much for the interview. Thank you, Andy. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you um, this evening and uh, hope well with you in Seattle. <laughs>